Welcome to the New Books Network. This is Carrie Lynn Evans welcoming you back to New Books and Secularism, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. Today, I'm looking forward to sharing with you Nonverts, the Making of Ex-Christian America by Professor Stephen Bullivant. The United States is in the midst of a religious revolution, or perhaps it is better to say a non-religious revolution. Around a quarter of U.S. adults now say they have no religion. The great majority of these religious nuns also say that they used to belong to a religion but no longer do. These are the nonverts. Think converts, but from having religion to having none. Even on the most conservative of estimates, there are currently about 59 million of them in the United States. Nonverts, the making of ex-Christian America by Professor Bullivant, explores who they are and why they joined the rising tide of the ex-religious. It draws on dozens of interviews, original analysis of high-quality survey data, and a wealth of cutting-edge studies to present an entertaining and insightful exploration of America's ex-religious landscape. While American religion is not going to die out anytime soon, ex-Christian America is a growing presence in national life. America's religious revolution is not only a religious one. It is catalyzing a profound social, cultural, moral, and political transformation. Stephen Bullivant is Professor of Theology and the Sociology of Religion at St. Mary's University, London. He's Professorial Research Fellow at University Notre Dame in Sydney, Australia. He holds doctorates in Theology from Oxford and Sociology from Warwick. He joined St. Mary's in 2009, having previously held posts at Heathrop College, London, and Wolfson College, Oxford. He's also held visiting fellowship at the Institute for Social Change at the University of Manchester, Blackfriars Hall at University of Oxford, and the Institute for Advanced Studies at the University College London. He joins me today to talk about his latest book. Stephen, thanks so much for being here. Delight to be here. Thank you for having me. So let's start with you. Tell us a bit about yourself and how you came to work in your field. Uh, Well, I'm a a theologian and a sociologist of religion. Um, I teach at a university in London and also mostly virtually, but also in person part of the year um, at the University of Notre Dame in Sydney, Australia. Um, I ended up I ended up studying theology, first of all, by accident. Um, There's a whole story there, but um, I wanted to study philosophy and you couldn't do that by itself where I was at Oxford. So I ended up doing theology, but then kind of became more interested in that. And when I was doing my doctorate in theology, looking at the Catholic engagement with atheism and non-religiosity and and secularism, I was sort of reading around whatever sociology of those subjects I could find. And there wasn't very much. And it was a time of the new atheism when kind of things were getting interesting sociologically. Um, and and so you know was encouraged to do bits and then that became bigger bits and then that became a doctorate and then that became most of what i do now is is sociology okay that's great so next i want to ask you how the idea for this particular book came to be why does a british scholar of religion write a book focused on american non-religion yeah, uh, yeah well I, I i i'm a scholar i work on i teach and write quite a bit on american religion i one of my previous books was looking at kind of catholic decline in britain and america um over the second half of the 20th century um so i mean america is always a place that i've found a very interesting place a place i enjoy going to so it's nice to have a sort of a work related reason to go um but also you know when you work in this field of you know, the sociology of non-religion, as we often call it. Um, One of the big stories and, you know, arguably maybe the biggest story driving, uh, there was a kind of a, that that feels fairly new. And and it was really only the past 15 years that the kind of sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists have all started getting seriously interested in the topic. Um, and, And one of the drivers of that, of course, was this rise of the nons, this kind of very rapid, um, you know, every year, you know, there's even more people in America who say they have no religion from it being very low, kind of in single digits right up into the kind of mid 90s. And now it's about what 
depending on your survey, a quarter to a third of the US adult population. So that's always been, you know, one of the big things to look at, to explore, to try and explain. Um, And on the one hand, there's been a lot of research. um, But equally, I, you know, in my hubris, possibly, felt that, you know, I I had something, something worth saying. um, And, and, you know, whilst learning much from drawing on, you know, using, um, agreeing with much of the existing scholarship, you know, thought, thought there was, you know, um, more to do in trying to understand, both understand, but also explain how this has come about and, and if you like, what it means for America, to put it a bit grandiosely. <laughs> no, that's fair. Uh, so let me start by asking you about your research methods. Your first few pages paint some lively portraits of ex-Christians, which introduces your reader not only to the range of personalities that this category encompasses, but also gives us a sense of the fact that your book is based on qualitative research from a lot of interviews with diverse individuals. So would you say that's an accurate characterization? Is that what you were trying to convey with your introduction? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's two things. I mean, there's a fair bit of a... We have... I mean, America's very good for this in that we have very good, uh, you know, what are called quantitative, you know, statistical sources. You know, we have those Pew Research Forums. We have the, you know, the biannual General Social Survey. You know, we... America particularly is, you know, well... Um, resourced in terms of kind of big national survey trends and things like that. So, so there's, there's there's kind of two things. So on the one hand, you know, those are critical for kind of. I often, you know, explain this to my students as saying, well, we need we need the numbers, we need the the statistics, we need you know, well, um, kind of you know, well thought out surveys to try and map religion and and, and probe it as best we can. But it's a fairly blunt tool, and and so this kind of gives us the skeleton. But you know, in order to lay the the real rich and interesting flesh, if you like, to continue that metaphor, you know, we need to talk to people. You know, we need to we need to um, you know, if you're going to write a book about you know why why suddenly so many Americans who were raised as some kind of religious uh, now identify as having no religion. Um, Yes, part of that is you're going to say, well, you know, what what are the demographic characteristics of these groups? You know, um, you know, in, are they do they tend to skew young or you know skew in particular ethnic categories or you know what's the regional distribution? You need all that, but you also need to go and, and talk to them. Um, and so this book was, um, you know, there's about seventy people we ended up interviewing over all over the states um you know trying to get as as big a range of experience and and particularly what i wanted to do in this book was um to take seriously both the individual narratives and in order to do that you need to have talked to a lot of individuals um but also i wanted to convey something of how this plays out differently um within different denominational traditions so you know you talk to you know a couple of dozen ex-evangelical nons you know they're all different but there's going to be a certain commonality a certain coherence to those compared to you know a group of ex-catholic nons ex-mormon nons ex-mainline nons and and it was important to um you know in, in picking who to interview and, 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 and how to, you know, select people and sample um, people, um, you know, to try and make sure there was some decent numbers coming from each of some of these groups. Plus, like so, a full age range, full, you know, every other kind of demographic category. Right. So next, I'll ask you about the broader context of this research. What is it, do you think, about this current religious shift in the United States that makes it unique from the shifts in belief that we might study elsewhere or at other times? Well, I mean, mean, you know, America has always been, well, always been, um, certainly it's been, you know, European visitors in the 19th century, people like Charles Dickens, you know, Alexis de Tocqueville, um, you know, come away from America saying how very religious it is. Um, And... 
so there's always been something distinctive and not just that it that there's more of it but it, it has a it, it, it's it, it works like you know it, it relates differently to politics um you know different denominations are kind of um doing things differently you've got uh this kind of a wealth of small vigorous revival groups if you like um there's a lot of uh, creativity originality kind of entrepreneurialism in in american religion so american religion has always been an interesting thing in its own right one of Many interesting things over the 20th century has been the fact that while certainly in the second half of that century, many quasi, I always say quasi comparable countries because nowhere it's really comparable to the United States. Um, But places like Canada, places like Britain, places like Australia, places like France or the Netherlands, um, you know, they've all not only has church going and various indicators of believing um, declined in some cases very a great deal um, but we've had a a very big kind of you know segment of the population who see themselves as having no religion whereas in america even though church attendance may have been declining at least in the mainline churches and the catholic churches since the 60s and 70s the number of people in the country who said they had no religion, you know, remained in the single digits, you know, really, 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 you know, in Britain, you know, it was about 40, 50 percent by, you know, the the 90s. In America, it was kind of still 8 percent. Um, and that was interesting in itself. But then to then for it to then suddenly shift and shift so fast, um, you know, that that needs explaining. So in addition to your interviews, you also refer to a wide range of surveys that have, among other things, measured the religious affiliations of the population over time. You mentioned there's a whole lot of uh, rich data from Pew and, and other groups. So I want to ask you about working with this data. What are some of the things we should know about how it's collected and how it should be best understood? Yeah, this is one of the things I um, talk about in the book um, in, in, in more detail than you normally see, I think. You know, you normally get these statistics, quote, you know, like eight, eight per, you know, X percent of Y's support um, Q, you know, Q being some policy or something like that, or, you know, a particular religious group, you know, as uh, increasing from 18 percent to 23 percent or something like that. Um, and you know it's important to realize uh, you know how those uh, numbers are got at and you know it's not that they're they're kind of made up out of somewhere but you know there's a there's a way that you get at them so I wanted to talk a bit about kind of survey methodology some of the problems that uh, we have but also in this domain to explain why it is that you know you'll read one article from yeah I don't know Pew was saying like 23% of the US population are nons. Um, and then, you know, the next week you might read, a, you know, new figures from the general social survey say 28% are nons. And then there'll be another survey that says a totally different number. And you, it's important to realize the various kind of things. You know, it's not, that the, it's not that one of them's right and the others are wrong. Um, it's different ways of counting different methods by which surveys are administered, but also different ways that you ask the question can affect the proportion of people uh, who answer it in certain ways. And and it can it's not kind of like random. Like if you ask the same question in the same way, you know, from year to year, you get a very consistent pattern. Um, And if you ask, you know, another question in a different way, year on year, again, you know, they may both be going up at the same rate, but, you know, they they make sense um, on their own terms. Uh, so, you know, part of what I wanted to do was to say, you know, look, um, there are different ways to ask this question. There are different ways to do surveys, um, partly because of the kind of thing that religious identity is. It's complicated. Um, you know, lots of people can say, well, you know, on the one hand, I'm, I guess I'm Catholic because I'm baptized and, you know, we, but well, we sort of sometimes went to church, but not often. And, you know, you can give yourself a, a, a Catholic 
um, story, but also you can give you equally honestly give yourself a non-religious story and say, well, to be honest, we never really believed anything. Certainly, my mum didn't, and the, from things my dad said, I don't think he believed any of it either. I, frankly, you know, don't know what I believe, and you know, there's there's no way I, you know, agree with the church on this or that. So again, you can kind of you know relate a very um, coherent, uh, you know honest picture of yourself as being non-religious now when you get asked the question you know what religion are you um you know tick one um you know it's not a surprise if the slight changes of wording might nudge the same person to to veer more towards catholic or non or, or whatever um, so it was important, I thought, to unpack, you know, not in any kind of greatly detailed way, hopefully not in a boring way, but just to kind of explain a bit how, wh- where these kind of numbers come from. Right. So keeping all of that in mind, what does the data reveal about the overall state of the non-religiousness in the United States of, uh, of America right now? So again, you know, depending on how you ask the question, but, you know, you know, rigorous highly regarded, well done surveys, you know, depending on which you pick, you're going to come out with somewhere between about a quarter to about a third um, of US adults, so Americans over 18, you know, will tick no religion when asked what their religious affiliation is. Um, and beyond that, I mean, obviously, it, it's, it's more, there's certain areas or certain, uh, both areas in the big sense so like you know the pacific northwest is, tends to have a higher rate of nons than normal you know some of the southern states tend to have a lower rate but they've all gone up you know it's not just that you know uh the growth in the nons has only been in certain places i mean you know in in alabama there's more nons than there were 20 years ago but there's still compared to you know oregon uh you know fewer nons um so you know there's a geographical story to tell it, even within, you know, single states, you know, there's got to be possibly big difference between, you know, cosmopolitan, uh, you know, college town versus, you know, the, the small towns, um, you know, in, in, in the hinterland, say. Um, racially, nons, at, at, the, at the, the sort of the top level, look about as racially diverse as Americans in general. Um, they're certainly as white as Americans in general. Um, there's as large a proportion of non-whites, nons as there are non-white American adults. Um, you know, there's there's different uh, subgroups that may be more or less represented. Um, male, female breakdown. The nons skew male, but only a bit. I mean, it's something like 52% to 48%. I mean, it's not not huge i mean partly because the nons are now you know whatever whatever we think the u.s average is well a quarter of that average is made up of people who are nons so you know nons are looking more and more like americans in general um you know this one of the the big issues where they tend to skew different um is they they do tend to be more kind of liberal leaning than americans in general but even so, you've still got kind of five million uh, Republican voted nons, for example. Um, so, kind of on any measure, um, you know, you're going to find big chunks of nons who, you know, could be anyone. I mean, <laughs> I think that's one of the big stories about the nons is that there's not one type of person who's a non. It's kind of, you know, all kinds of everyone essentially. Yeah, they seem to be spreading evenly. So your denomination-focused chapters start by looking at Mormonism, using interviews with a handful of Exmos, as some of them call themselves, uh, to examine the deconversion phenomenon as it is unfolding in this religious community. So you admit that Mormonism may seem like an unusual place to start, considering that Mormons only make up about 2% of the American population, but that it's a good choice because this story, in fact, contains a lot of the important themes and patterns that emerged as a, as representative of the whole. So tell us what's going on here. Yeah, it was like um, the, the nice thing about starting with the Mormons is is that it's uh, it was almost an overture to some of the big themes that were going to come up in the come up in the book, and and you know what 
various things that are going to come up again and again, like the rise of the internet playing a role, um, the breakdown of uh, religious subcultures, um, partly because the LDS are, you know, I mean, there's lots of them, but, you know, they're compared to, say, Catholics or, um, you know, evangelicals that are much more self-contained geographically as well as kind of religiously um, group. Um, it means that you can talk about themes that you're going to keep coming back to, but to be able to do it in quite uh, a, a, a clear way where you don't have to keep making all these qualifications because there's there's less complexity um, because it's, as I say, it's, it's one group that you're looking at. Um, and also, um, you know, Mormons are just interesting. <laughs> uh, you know, they're a really interesting group. And I think one of the, the things that's, that's really interesting about them in this particular rise of the nons is because for a very long time, you know, the Mormons have been growing and growing and growing. And, you know, other churches have always looked to the LDS and thought, you know, there's lots of things that we wouldn't want to do and or believe but you know they certainly do a good job at you know raising kids who then go off to be believing practicing mormons you know everyone admires you know the zeal the missionary zeal the commitment you know the the kind of the the social architecture of the church that kind of you know makes the church um, you know, a, a large part of people's social lives. If you're, you know, if you're more, but it's not just about being there on a Sunday. It's you know, your whole kind of social world is, you know, revolves around your your ward, which is kind of like your parish. You know, um, but you know, in the past couple of decades, you know, there's been this noticeable trend of people raised Mormon, raised and not just like a bit Mormon. You know, raised in the heartlands as like properly Mormon um, leaving um, and the LDS leadership themselves this is something that they are concerned about and you know one of the arguments in the book is that well if the evangelicals and the Mormons if it's a problem for them who have booked the you know have done far better than Catholics and mainliners have for a long time then this really just shows what an across-the-board phenomenon this is. Um, so yeah, and and also there were just some really good stories to tell with you know some of those. I mean, what what would I tend to find is that you tend to get more dramatic stories of how they became nuns, and more of a story to tell from people who were raised, who kind of had something significantly religious to to move away from you know people raised uh you know main you know people episcopalians tend not to have some dramatic narrative about how they you know got in a car and just drove and they've never spoken to their parents since because they've been cut out of people's wills and that kind of stuff um you know some of the mormon stories that you could tell and you know one of the things you want to do when you're writing a book is especially early on, is to interest your readers. Um, so actually, there were kind of solid scholarly reasons for front-loading the book with some of the Mormon stories, but actually there were just some compelling personal narratives to tell as well. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Let's talk about some of your interviewees for this chapter. Tell us about them and how their stories fit in with the larger picture, what they yeah. helped you conclude about these patterns of becoming nuns. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all of the interviews were just a joy to do. You know, you get to travel around America, which, you know, is it's a pleasure in itself. And then, you know, people would be, you know, would sit down, you know, over a couple of hours or whatever over, you know, coffee or beer or something and, and just really tell you their life stories i mean it's a real kind of privilege and an honor to get to do that as for a researcher um the mormon stories uh you know there's lots of memorable ones and lots of memorable moments and memorable people um but i think you know one of the really striking things is that in a way that you know if you talk to people you know raised catholic in pittsburgh or somewhere in the 50s or earlier you know you if you read those narratives um, you know, people say that, you know, oh, I was I was eight years old until I ever met someone who wasn't 
a Polish Catholic. Um, you know, we di- we didn't know. You know, we we knew that non Catholics existed, but you know, you didn't. You'd never met one. Um, it's very difficult to do that now um, for almost all denominations in um, America, unless. I mean, there are exceptions, um, but, you know, the interesting thing about the, the Mormons is that on the one hand, you know, Mormons are mainstream, you know, there's like millions of them and, you know, they're, you know, it's not that they live walled, it's not, they're not like the Amish or something, you know, they, they are a fully integrated part of mainstream America and mainstream popular culture and mainstream politics and, you know, business life and everything else, sports, um, you know, it's not that they're like kind of living off in a wall, but if, if you're living in, you know, southern Idaho or, um, you know, much of Utah, at least outside Salt Lake City, then, you know, you could easily be living in a town that's kind of, you know, 90 percent of people are are Mormon. Um, so, you know, everyone, you know, everyone you've met, everyone you go to school with, everyone you kind of meet, not only at church, but at all the other social things that happen around the church are also, you know, believing practicing mormons as you know as far as you know um so if you're raised in this kind of world then you know when you start either having doubts um and then thinking you're the only person um and then for you know for a lot of so a lot a large part of my some of the most memorable interviews was kind of their they're often very dramatic kind of you know guilt-ridden and angst-ridden narratives about how you know they they had these doubts and they didn't really have anyone to express them and then suddenly they'd find you know either when they were moved to college or you know they they'd moved off they you know they got married by this point or something you know to a good mormon girl or a good mormon boy and then they move somewhere for work and then they're in this different world and exposed to these different things or and this is a big thing for you know um people of a certain age is you know when the internet comes and then suddenly you've got this whole world of you know different views and and you find that there's other people with doubts about mormonism um and there's a community of them or you know your cousin who who left and you've not seen for a long time and these are like the black sheep of the family suddenly they get back in touch and you kind of find out why they left um so there's there's a you know this kind of the the erosion of the sort of you know metaphorical walls um but then the effect that this has on the family you know if, if you're raised in a very and this isn't just a mormon thing if you, you know if you're raised in a very kind of strongly not just a church family but a church family and community in which it's not just your family that's very religious it's everyone's family that's very religious then for you to be the only one who isn't religious you know has all sorts of at, at the very best awkwardnesses you know when it comes to you know telling things to your family or how you're raising your kids or how you're living your life or all that and you know and, and, and at the kind of the harsh end you know like periods of estrangement from from parents you know all sorts of kind of heartbreak and and just like open wounds and and you know really you know really kind of sensitive and, and painful um you know, either memories or you know current current realities for you know for, for for people who have been raised that way and you know have have left for for whatever reason. So next, you look at Protestantism, or perhaps more specifically, mainline Protestantism. Um, there's challenges just with creating these classifications, isn't there? First, maybe tell us who this group represents. Yeah. So I mean, this. We, we do have, I mean, the, the, that was also one of the nice things about talking about Mormons early because, you know, yes, there are other Mormon groups, but basically if you say Mormon, you mean the, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, plus some much smaller fringe groups, which maybe is. Um, now, you talk about, you know, mainline Protestantism, and it's like, well, well what's that? Um, this is a term, I mean, there's a historic, definition it was a seven kind of heritage brand northeastern um denominations you know presbyterianism congregationalism you know uh respectable you know this the sort of uh denominations that you know a, the president would be from kind of you know 
um, sober, respectable, uh, you know, all American Protestantism. Um, so there's a sort of a the reason they're called the main line is there was like the the, the Pennsylvania main line or whatever to Philadelphia, which is where there was this kind of ecumenical um, confederation of, of these seven churches. But actually, in, in a much more extended sense, it, it means Protestants who aren't evangelicals or fundamentalists, essentially. So, you know, Episcopalians, Methodists, um, you know, uh, Northern Baptists, Congregationalists, um, you know, often the, you know, these were often the churches, you know, like big Ivy League universities were often founded by these mainline denominations, things like that. Um, and, and But actually in the book, you know, I, I talk about all this and the various scholarly, uh, you know, arguments over who counts and who doesn't and, and how these definitions come about. And I say, well, actually, probably the, the best way of thinking about this is to look at... Um, the Simpsons and King of the Hill and, you know, pop culture, you know, um, you know, the Simpsons, uh, that's the mainline church they go to, the first church of Springfield or whatever it's called. Um, and, and in King of the Hill, it's the same. Arlen First Methodist is, is, is the mainline. They're not kind of super evangelical, committed, you know, the sort of church that, that normal, typical Amer- all American family goes to in sitcoms. Um, except maybe there might be one episode where someone finds religion and goes off and joins a, you know, a, a Pentecostal church for an episode or something like that. Um, so yeah, one of the arguments was like the main line is kind of boring, respectable American Protestantism. Um, I did find it interesting how often you chose examples from King of the Hill and Simpsons in particular, but TV in general as a as a way of signaling. Um, I guess what has bubbled up into the public consciousness and demonstrates like just the broadness of those views or those kinds of characterizations. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, American popular culture is is an important both a reflector of, um, you know, kind of mainstream attitudes, opinions, and or at least you know one version of mainstream attitudes, opinions, views. But also, it's a it, it's a you know it there's a dialectic so you know how things are presented in and when i say the media i don't mean like you know on 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 news channels i you know although that's part of it i mean in kind of like uh mainstream entertainment you know shows like friends or simpsons you know those kind of like millions viewing you know uh popular mainstream shows actually tells you a lot um both over time uh, but also that just kind of like, you know, where's the kind of the temperature, if you like, how are certain groups viewed, you know, who, who is a relatable character, things like that, that actually tells you a lot about society, society. Um, plus I, you know, I guess I consume a lot of, uh, you know, American popular culture. So, you know, it, it's always good to, to, to feel that that counts as research. <laughs> no, I like it because uh, I'm a fan of The Simpsons and I incorporate it in my university lectures as well because it's surprisingly relevant and yeah. illustrative oftentimes. And so um, I just I just loved finding it in your book as well. <laughs> but um, so uh, considering all this, what is then the story of Protestantism in America? You've already alluded to the fact that it, it in a lot of ways represents, quote unquote, normal America. Um, but what were some of the personal stories that brought to light its state in the country today? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, you know, probably the, the, the biggest story of, uh, you know, the mainline Protestantism and the rise of the nuns is that it's, that there's not really any dramatic, you know, I, I, I think I, quoted taylor swift about you know it's not it's not love it's not hate it's indifference i mean people raise mainline episcopalian say um you know don't feel that they've had anything much to to leave um and you know that's not everyone but you know that's the kind of the the tenor like you know yeah we sometimes went to church but it wasn't really a big thing and you know my parents you know it's you know it's almost as if, like, if they were still going to church by the time they're in the twenties, you know, that would make them the weird one rather than the, you know, the fact that none of them go to church anymore of that generation. You know, that's that's just normal, um, you know, for people who were raised in in, in that world. Now, um, 
and one of the really interesting things was uh you know you talk i, I talked to um you know people who'd been raised catholic or evangelical or something or or immigrants one of the interesting things is that you know you get chinese immigrants coming to america and feel like in order to kind of americanize their kids um you know they want the kids to be kind of fully american you know they teach them you know they speak english at home um and they they feel that you you need to be some kind of mainline protestant to kind of fit in and get ahead so they'd send them to you know uh, local Sunday schools to to acculturate them to being an American, and you know it was interesting which ones they'd send them to. You know, so they they wouldn't send them to like an evangelical one because you might you know it's a bit weird and they might get a bit too keen. You'd send them to the Episcopalians or the Methodists. You know, that would be kind of a a safe uh, amount of Christianity. But you know, they weren't going to kind of like go all in or anything. Um, and also, you, you, I got this from you know some some of my interviewees who were atheists. Um, they they thought it was important for the kids to you know have some um, acquaintance with religion because it's you know it's a big thing and it's good for them to know have some uh, you know cultural knowledge. But they also didn't want them to kind of catch any religion, so they'd send them to. Uh, Episcopalian, it was Episcopalian again, uh, Episcopalian Sunday school to kind of inoculate them against ever kind of catching a, you know, ever kind of becoming a Hare Krishna or, a, you know, a, a fundamentalist or something. Um, so, I mean, in, in a, you know, and, you know, the mainline churches have had, you know, a long period of decline from the 60s and 70s. Um, and, and, and yeah, you know, this is the kind of the big story. And, you know, the Catholic story we'll talk about separately, maybe, but there's a lot of commonalities in certain parts of the country, you know, where you've got, you know, lots of big old grand churches, you know, on every couple of blocks in some cities, you know, very few people in any of them. Um, so, you know, the, the the mainline story was, you know, in a sense, a good contrast to the Mormon one, because, um you know, it's just, it was just a very different kind of church world to be to be raised in, um, because it was fairly low, very kind of low intensity, maybe the thing way to think about. It. And again, The Simpsons is a good example of this. You know, like you know, you there's that kind of yeah, we 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 go on a Sunday because we're meant to sort of thing, and it, everyone ev- everyone finds it boring. You know, <laughs> including the including the priest. Um, you know, again. It's one of those relatable jokes in The Simpsons, you know, that that's there because a lot of people will recognize their own, uh, you know, church communities in that. So it's often suggested that the precipitous decline in reported religiosity may have more to do with people feeling more comfortable now checking the nun box uh, than they did before, but that the overall character of the country hasn't actually changed that much. So do you think there's a lot of merit to this idea or is it actually more complex? Um, I think there's merit to the first bit. I think there's little merit to the second bit because... um, the fact that first of all it's not simply the case that today's nons are simply people who used to you know not believe not practice but still tick the box i mean the the rise of the nons yes nons it is true that people who don't believe and don't practice are more likely to tick non now than they used to be in the past but it's also the case that you know people who used to be kind of believing practicing are also now ticking the non box. So it's it's not the rise of the nons isn't simply due to kind of people being more honest, if you like. Um, add to that, um, you know, you know, the question is, well, why was it that people who didn't practice or didn't believe in the past still tick the box? Um, and you know, the, the argument is is that well. A world, in, you know, or a, 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 a nation in which even the people who neither believe nor practice still think of themselves as some kind of Christian is a very different world to the ones where the people who neither believe nor practice don't even, you know, think of themselves as having no religion. Um, the fact that 
that people who were only very weakly or culturally attached to Christianity still feel that they belong um, tells you something about the overarching religious temperature or atmosphere of, of the place. Um, and, and in fact, one of the things I point out in the book is that one of the, you know, one of the things that fuels the rise of the nuns is, I think, you know, every year there's this article that says nuns on the rise. And so, you know, every year people read it and think, actually, I think that's what I am. Oh, nuns. Oh, yeah. Well, that sounds like me. So the next time your survey comes around, you tick nuns box and it keeps going up. So it's partly that. But as I say, I mean, a world in which people who don't believe and don't practice um, are still ticking Methodist, Episcopalian, Catholic, whatever. Um, And actually meaning and actually doing it honestly. It's not that they kind of think, oh, I hope no one finds out. It's that they do still feel Catholic um, or whatever. Um, That tells you actually that that's probably the biggest indicator that something quite serious has shifted very quickly at a cultural level. So for those folks who genuinely are changing, um, do you think there's, and more than just they're more willing to be honest now, or they got the idea from reading it in an article, uh, do you think there's some other reasons why they're defecting, or is or is that better to save till the end after we've discussed well, all of these reasons. groups? I mean, the, the thing is, there's multiple reasons. This is why you want to go out and interview dozens yeah. and dozens and dozens of these people. Um, and, 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 you know, there's certain clusters of reasons, and again, you know, the particular configurations are, you know, more common in certain denominations than others. But there's actually all sorts of personal, intellectual, political, um, you know, scandals related, um, lifestyle related, moral related. The, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why. And, and there's there's often not a single reason. It's often that there's this kind of... Uh, combination of reasons that you know over time you know very few people go from being kind of believing practicing one week and then you know an atheist non the next week um you know there's always this kind of gradual thing so you've got you've got two things you've got these kind of people who really did used to believe in practice and then there's all sorts of things play into this how they now end up not believing not practicing and not identifying but the other big part of the story is you know, this thing, you know, people who, you know, not believe, not practice, but still identify in a, in a, in a real way with the church they were baptized. And Catholics are the best example of this. So you'll have people who say, well, I don't believe, you know, we've not been to mass in years, but, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely a Catholic, you know, like, Catholicism is such a big part of my identity and, you know, we're fourth generation, you know, Irish and therefore we are Catholic, you know, that kind of cultural, ethnic kind of sense of being um, Catholic. But actually that doesn't pass on to the next generation. You know, that only really works if you've been raised in a sufficiently kind of Catholic world as a child that that's kind of ingrains it into you. Um, you know, if you're not going to church, if you're not kind of um, exposing your kids to that world, well, when they grow up and then, you know, they get to a point when they hit 18 that they start filling in surveys, um, you know, they may have been baptized, but it's never meant enough to them to keep ticking the box. Um, you know, when so so the other thing is that kind of generational decline. You know, we've had like a practicing generation, a, a non-practicing but still identifying generation and then you know the next generation neither practice nor identify so there's there's, that's the other much less of an issue in mormons or evangelicals but for the mainline and large parts of the catholic world that generational kind of step decline is quite a big part of the story yeah, it's interesting to think about the generational transmission too, and, and from this perspective that it really, if it's going to shift, it, it mostly only shifts in one direction. Yep. That's really interesting. So let's turn now to the chapter on the brand of American Christianity known as evangelical. 
probably the most famous brand lately anyways. So this is another term that though it's commonly thrown around, it's also pretty tough to pin down. Uh, what do you think are the defining features of this group? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, you know, you can, the surveys like, you know, whether you, it's often like, you know, do you, are you a Bible believing or like born again as some of these terms that then, you know, it you know these people are therefore what we mean as evangelicals or something like that. Um, there's a sense in which evangelicals are kind of a state of mind. You know, again, a bit like with the main line, yes, and there are surveys that do this. Um, you know, we'll sit down and say, well, which particular subdenomination are you a member of? And you know, that's an evangelical one, or that's a mainline one, or that's a fundamentalist one, or you know, based on kind of. Uh, you know, the specific group that you are a member of. But actually, you know, when we think about evangelicals, it's as much about a, a style, a style of presentation and, and confidence um, as it is about which particular, you know, branch of which denomination you happen to be a member of. You know, you'll have, you know, uh, mainline churches they're essentially evangelical you know they've evangel there's been a kind of a evangelification of certain churches in a, you know in a bid to try and get people um so it's difficult to pin down um you know but people tend to know people will say that they were evangelicals you know people it, it's one of those brands where you know people People know it when they see it, if, if 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 that makes sense. You know, there's a certain a certain style of evangel. You know, mega churches are kind of the classic example of an evangelical church. You know, big jumbotrons and you know a rock band in the back and you know a, a guy in a sharp suit and and you know people on fire for praising Jesus with 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 donuts and coffee afterwards. Right, that's kind of like the classic example. And there's plenty of that. Um, but you know, I've been to e evangelical services in you know uh you know a, kind of a very low-end motel on the outskirts of nashville or in a farmhouse in southern kansas you know it as i say it's um it's as much about uh a kind of a cultural feel to the place as much as it is about any particular kind of one thing you can pin down so your interviews with ex-evangelicals seems to really put sex and purity culture in the yeah. foreground for this group. So can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the interesting things. So, um, you know, different, you know, there's, there's certain things that come up, you know, across the board with dogs. There's certain things that you hear about a lot only in certain groups. Certainly any particularly the women, not just the women, but particularly the women of uh, millennials, essentially, you know, one of the things that always came up was, and it, well, I wasn't asking people about, oh, so was purity culture a thing? In fact, I asked very few of those kind of questions across at all. I mean, you just let people tell you their story um, and see what came out. Um, but no, purity culture, you know, those um, silver promise rings um, was often cited as... Um, it's kind of, you know, either something that they found, not especially, especially in retrospect, having left, but as often as the because of double standards around purity culture is often one of the things that's cited by ex-evangelical, you know, women in their 30s, you know, kind of my generation as one of the things that looking back where they think, well, that didn't seem right to me at the time, say, and, and so it will either be that, you know, like different standards for boys versus girls, you know, but or, or it will be like, you know, we, you know, one of our youth pastors who, you know, was was always like on us girls because, you know, we could, uh, you know, you could see our bra strap or something on, you know, something where, you know, but, you know, or it had this big obsession with like modesty or whatever. And, you know, um, being a proverbs woman or whatever. And uh, and then when you find out that he's having an affair with one of the teens in the group, um, you know it's those kind of uh, hypocrisies around um, purity culture that that as I say were often front and center in the the narratives that were that were coming out of people who'd been raised in that world. Not the only things that were being mentioned, but again, compared, to, you know, no one raised in the mainline churches, no one raised. Catholic Catholics might be citing other moral 
issues that they disagreed with and certainly other um you know hypocrisies and scandals but the specific um and especially the genderedness of that whole purity culture thing only evangelicals mentioned it and they mentioned it a lot so any conversation about the current state of American evangelicalism would be remiss to overlook Donald Trump. And you do uh, mention him as well. Uh, so much ink has been spilled in trying to square the circle of the appeal of this philandering con artist to the so-called moral majority, as the evangelicals like to think of themselves. So how do you understand this seeming contradiction? Yeah, a lot of the interviews, I mean, the interviews were done over a several years um but all after 2016 um and and sort of probably the bulk of them were done in 2018 so you know halfway through that that trump term um and you know one of the striking things was talk to ex-evangelicals you know this was kind of you know this this (laughs) this was like cited as you know proof that everything i ever suspected was right all along um not not quite all of them because you know i did interview trump voting nons and Trump voting ex evangelicals and but most of them thought that, you know, everything that everything I always thought and thought was just off about, you know, evangelicals and, and the GOP or whatever, um, was just synthesized and and distilled and, and and confirmed with this recent thing with Donald Trump. Um so that it looks like it's part of the story, right? It looks like that's part of the story as to, you know, the rise of ex-evangelical nons. Um, and certainly, as I say, for, for ex-evangelicals, this is kind of one more very obvious reason as to why they feel they were right to leave and kind of a plague on, you know, anyone who stays almost. Um, the bigger picture is actually quite difficult. I mean, there's no obvious. Um, there have been studies done. There's no obvious kind of, you know, leap up in people leaving, certainly becoming nons, um, you know, from having been evangelicals, you know, in the wake of, you know, the, the Trump candidacy and presidency or anything like that. And I think partly it's um, on the one hand, it alienated certain people who, you know, it was kind of maybe the final nail in their coffin, coffin and now they think of themselves as nons rather than, you know, evangelicals i think for other people though it's kept them in you know there's there's other people who don't believe don't practice um might tick non but actually because of the politics around evangelicalism that's one of the things that keeps them feeling like an evangelical um you know it's easy to forget sometimes i think especially if you hang out with you know college professors and social scientists um trump that's Certainly he was in 2018, you know, maybe less, actually less so now, but Trump's very popular. <laughs> Tens of millions of people voted for him um, twice. Um, so actually, the the Trump brand, uh, you know, certainly it, it turned a lot of people away from evangelicalism. But I think, you know, for others, it, it maybe kept them in. Um even though they might, you know, they, it was kind of one of maybe the few things that kind of kept them ticking the box almost. Um, so it's a very complicated picture, I think. Um, but no, certainly, uh, you know, this was, you know, for anyone who'd left, this was just either proof of, you know, why they'd left and glad they had, or you'd get people who weren't raised evangelical, but just kind of pointing to it as, you know, this is one of the problematic things about religion in America and why I don't want any part of any of it kind of thing. Interesting. So it skews both ways. Um, I didn't expect that the idea that, that some who maybe were drifting were felt more community because of the Trump effect. That's really interesting. So among the nuns, have you found many significant differences between those who were never religious and those who were formerly religious? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the kind of the big the big themes of the book. The book's called Nonverts, which is picking out not just nuns in general, but picking out the particular group of them um, who are kind of like 
the opposite of converts. So these are people who were raised religious, who now identify as non. And that's most nons in America. One of the points I make in the book is that, you know, we talk about the rise of the nons, but actually the vast majority of nons, it's not just that they have no religion in, but they used to have a religion. And actually that that that's significant. You know, you know, I talk quite a bit in the book about, you know, these kind of um, various ways in which our pasts influence our presence. Um, you know, in the same way that, you know, to be to be someone's ex-wife is 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 very different to being someone, you know, to being any other woman who that person is not currently married to. You know, um, you know, to be an ex-wife is in in a sense a statement about the present, um, but it's a statement about the present where the past has a very big bearing and and you know colors the present in the same way that you know, more positively being a veteran you know a, you know a veteran is someone who is not in the armed forces um but they're very different from everyone else who is not currently in the armed forces because they have been in the armed forces um you know uh there's lots of um identities um, like you know, to be a recovering alcoholic, you know, is is very different from from being a lifelong teetotaler. Um, so, in all sorts of positive and negative ways, you know, where we've come from, um, you know, who we've been in the past affects us in the present. Um, and this is most obvious with uh, ex Mormons and ex Evangelicals because because they've been they've grown up in a particular subculture. Um, in a particularly kind of in intensely religious way, very often um, it can't but colour who they are now, even to the level of like you know shared in jokes and like pop culture references, you know that you only get if you were raised in you know Utah in the nineties or you know small town evangelical Southern Baptist Texas. Uh, you know the power team and i mean like so i didn't i'd never heard about the power team but you know this is kind of like wrestling for people who weren't allowed to go to wrestling um you know it's like beefcakes who rip up phone books for jesus and it was a massive thing you know if you're an evangelical you know the power team with this massive thing but only if you're an evangelical so you know there's this whole kind of like world that you've you've grown up in that only makes sense to other people from that world. Um, so you often find, you know, so this is why, you know, ex-Mormons often hang out with other ex-Mormons because um, they understand each other. Um, and and the same with ex-evangelicals. So there's a sense in which there's a, there's a need for community with other people who understand um, but also, you know, there's all sorts of psychological studies done on what are called residue effects. So, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, people, ex-Catholics, um, you know, in all sorts of ways look more like current Catholics than, you know, people who've never been Catholic do in terms of politics, values, religious beliefs, you know, all moral attitudes, which is what you'd expect, Um but again, the fact that someone now ticks non doesn't erase, you know, the how they were raised, you know, how they've seen the world, you know, um, possibly for decades leading up to that. Um, so there's all sorts of ways. And I think the other ways that people who were raised religious and, and have left often feel that they have a, a kind of a dog in the fight um, or have a either either have a very positive nostalgic um feelings and relationship towards the religion they've left which is often the case you know people say i miss so much about being mormon or you know i miss so much about church but i just don't feel i can believe and i don't think i can go back but i miss it um or people have this kind of allergic reaction that they've had that it's been very traumatic and you know they can't they can't kind of look at anything religious without it kind of you know, making them angry or something. Um, and again, people who someone who's been raised with no religion, um, you know, just r- relates to it in a very different way. Kind of, you know, is able to look at it with indifference or distance or something in a way that if it's been a big part of who you've been, and it's probably also still a big part of your, 
you know, your mother, your siblings, your kind of, you know, your hometown, um, you know, it's very hard to kind of, for that not to have, to colour your your present. That makes a lot of sense. Well, let's talk about Catholicism in America. As it turns out, this is also a fairly diverse group, um, surprise, which surprised me. I, I guess I would have thought of them as being a little bit more um, uh, homogeneous. So can you tell us about them? Well, yeah, well, I mean, Catholics are huge, hugely diverse. Um, for a start, there's a lot of them. I mean, you know, Catholics are by far the biggest, um, you know, certainly single denomination. Uh, again, depending on how you cut the cloth, you know, you might say, well, if we add up all the different evangelical churches or whatever, then they're bigger than the Catholics. But the Catholics are just one big thing. I mean, it's a bit more complicated than that. But, you know, it's not that there's Baptists and uh, certain kinds of Methodists and certain kinds of whatevers, and we group them all under this evangelical banner, you know, there's all sorts of liturgical differences, cultural differences, even from parish to parish, you know, um, a huge diversity of different ethnic backgrounds, national backgrounds. Um, and the other thing, interesting thing about the Catholic Church is that, you know, a lot of the kind of the hot button moral issues that a lot of mainline denominations have split over, you know, the Episcopalian Church, Methodist churches, you know, you'll often have breakaway kind of schismatic groups who see themselves as the true Episcopalians or the true Methodists um, who have broken away over women priests or, you know, gay marriage or, you know, X, Y, Z, other issue. Within the Catholic Church, I mean, there have been tiny schisms at both left and right, but for the vast most part, you know, everyone in there, you know, might argue with each other, but they're they're still all in the same thing. Um, you know, I often think about, uh, you know, if it, it's 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 very easy to have a kind of a harmonious Thanksgiving dinner if, you know, you don't invite um, all the people you disagree with in the family. Um, but it's probably a healthier family if all the people who disagree with each other can still sit around the same table, um, at, at least at Thanksgiving, and, you know, rub along. Um and actually, that's quite striking in the Catholic Church is, is, is that, you know, you do see very big doctrinal, moral differences among kind of believing, practicing Catholics and a huge diversity of national background and ethnic cultural background and all sorts of stuff. Um, but they all still see themselves as Catholic. Um, so, yeah, the Catholic Church is, is very difficult to kind of tell a single story about because also you've, you've got this kind of mainlining of the Catholic Church, especially in, say, the Northeast, where somewhere like Pittsburgh, for example, you've got a big Catholic Church every couple of blocks. And in the same way, you've got a big Presbyterian Church every couple of blocks. Um, and, you know, the problems facing both denominations is very similar. You know, people no longer live in the cities, you know, generational decline, uh, you know, not enough priests, too many buildings. Whereas for the Catholics down south, somewhere like you know, Brownsville or something, Houston, they can't build churches quick enough because of immigrants. Um, so again, geographically, the Catholic Church looks very different uh, depending on where you are. But in all sorts of other ways, um, it's a it's a very kind of big and big and diverse tent, which obviously makes it difficult. Again, the Mormons much easier to tell a single story. Um, without having to keep adding in qualifications and complexity, um, the Catholics, it's very difficult. And, and obviously the Catholic, you know, the, uh, most of my work is, you know, in terms of denominations, is, is Catholic. So it's, it's a world I know particularly well. Okay, so tell us about some of your interviews with recovered Catholics and how this group of former religious folks might be similar or different from the other groups we've talked about. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. And, you know, on the one hand, a lot of them sound very mainline in inverted commas in that they say, well, you know, to be honest, we didn't, we were baptized and, you know, we had to go at Christmas and Easter or when our granny was in town, but it wasn't really a big thing. And, you know, our parents... You know, obviously they had us baptized and stuff, but to be honest, I don't think they ever really believed in that kind of stuff. Um, you know, that there was never any kind of um, 
you know, it's not that they were there at church three times a week, you know, that, that you often get with evangelicals or Mormons or something, you know, so there's that very kind of low, we talked about this before, but, you know, this kind of low level, um, you know, you have to go back two, three generations until you get into kind of committed Catholic believers in the family. Um, you know, the parents, you know, still certainly see themselves as Catholic and think it's important to have your kids baptized, at least to keep granny happy. Um, but it's not something that's a kind of a lived, um, committed day-to-day family reality for you growing up in the 90s or whatever. Um, so, you know, some of those stories sound very similar to the, you know, people raised Methodist or Presbyterian or something. Whereas some of them sound, you know, almost Mormon in like, we were raised in a, you know, this Puerto Rican neighborhood where everyone was Puerto Rican Catholic and it was a huge part of, uh, you know, everything revolved around the church and, you know, it was we all went to the Catholic school and it was this massive thing and, you know, the nuns would be round if you weren't at church on a Sunday and that kind of stuff and it was this massive thing and, you know, Catholicism is this really important thing and if, you know, we didn't, you know, send our kids to the Catholic school, it would be this massive issue in the family and that kind of stuff. Um you know, which is a, a very different vibe, but part, you know, it's that kind of second generation immigrant Catholicism, um, which is a very, you know, culturally, it's a very different kind of flavor of Catholicism to, you know, this kind of fourth, fifth generation Irish Catholicism in, you know, Pittsburgh or um, Baltimore or somewhere like that, New York. Um, so you, you you get all sorts and all sorts, you know, then there's like charismatic Catholics who are basically like Pentecostalist Catholics, if you like. There was a whole charismatic revival in the 70s and 80s in Catholicism. So if you were raised with a family who was influenced by that, then, you know, you were, you know, very similar to some of the evangelical stories or some of the Pentecostal stories that you're hearing, you know, about, you know, our parents were always speaking in tongues and talking about spiritual warfare with demons and that kind of stuff. And again, just a very diff- different world. So depending on kind of which bit of the Catholic Church, you know, it, it can be very different. But there's certain, you know, certain things, you know, we're always going to come up, you know, people, many ex-Catholic evangelical, ex-Catholic nons, you know, disagree with the church on abortion, disagree with the church on contraception or gay rights or something like that. Um, that may not be the reason they've left, but that's kind of one of the things they cite as, you know, why I'm glad I have left almost. And, and obviously the, the sexual abuse scandal. I mean, you know, this was a big thing cited as, you know, often by people who'd never had much connection to begin with, but, but almost, there's almost a sense that before the Catholic sexual abuse crisis was this kind of erupted, particularly with the Boston Globe revelations in 2002 and, and afterwards and everything since, you know, to be Catholic, you know, to be like Irish Catholic or Polish Catholic was a kind of a, you know, a a nostalgic family thing to be proud of. Even if you didn't believe, even if you didn't go to church, you know, you still felt Catholic. You were proud to tick that box. You, you know, you made a big thing of St. Patrick's Day or whatever. Um, for those people who had very little belief or practice connection to the church, you know, I think the, you know, the brand got understandably kind of toxified, you know, with, with the abuse crisis, you know, how could it not? So that again, as you'd expect, you know, that becomes quite a dominant theme um, in, in those interviews. So what do you think the future holds for deconversion trends? Um, Yeah, I I think, uh, I mean, predicting the future is always hard, um, partly because it's, you know, it's, such a complex picture you know to try and it's hard enough to kind of map it accurately at any one time let alone you know thinking how all these different factors which interrelate with religion kind of all you know uh a bit like chaos theory you know how do they all play out you know even 10 years from now you know even even five years from now necessarily um um the nods are going to keep rising i mean there's there's no question about that you know if you look at the 
you know, the older generations tend to be more religiously practic- more religiously identifying. The younger generations tend to be much more likely to be nons. So, you know, even at the simple rate of, you know, each year some of the older people are going to die and there'll be a few more younger people hitting 18 to then be included in surveys. You know, you're going to see, you know, a gradual, you know, demographic transition, you know, of, of, of the nons becoming more and more of a, a bigger part of the society you, you can hardly not uh, just with the how the demography is um also you know as nons start to settle down and you know as the millennial nons are having kids that are going to be raised without any religion mostly um you know we know that being raised non-religious tends to stick you know uh, so, you know, it, we're going to expect that, you know, the nons are going to grow, but the proportion of them who were raised nons is, is going to grow. So, you know, the nonverts, you know, all, there's always going to be nonverts, people raised religious who become nons, but as a proportion of the nons as a whole, that's going to shrink because there's going to be many more people who were raised nons to be kind of a part of that group it's hard to predict you know we're where do, you know present trends never continue you know like present trends if present trends continue you know like america will be a hundred percent non-religious by you know 20 20 i don't know uh you know 2074 i mean that's nonsense like you know present trends never continued like that um you know there will come a point when the first of all that the rate of increase will slow and then level off and then at some point um you know you're probably going to see the nons decline a bit um you know not to kind of back down to single figures but you know there's there's always dynamism in a religious socio-religious landscape it's hard to know you know i I can't can't really predict where it's going to peak at i mean i it i can certainly imagine it hitting over over 50 percent you know in the next few decades it's certainly possible um but equally um you know th- you know american religion is by no means in its death throes um you know american religion is still pretty strong very resilient it's got a lot of resources um and i think you know the churches are aware that this is an issue and you know a keen to find ways to either reach the nons and evangelize them or or stop more of their young people joining them now you know it's it's an uphill task um but you know the you know american especially the evangelicals especially the mormons especially the catholics you know there's the, you know they're, they're not they're not on a trajectory down to zero um you know they they they're, they're pretty strong and they're you know they're gonna they're going to survive and and still be a significant part of the the American landscape. So I wanted to ask you another, um, this kind of a methodological question. Uh, Going into this research, did you have any hypotheses that turned out to be wrong? Or were there any places that you can think of where your research really surprised you? I tried to go into the, you know, it's hard to go into a research field, you know, with a completely open mind because you, you don't go into a research field unless you've, you know, read a lot and thought a lot about the topic. Um, so I don't think the – I think probably the denominational differences didn't surprise me. It's just I didn't know what I'd find. You know, I wasn't expecting to find something in particular. You know, I wasn't expecting to find Mormons would be like this versus like that versus – like that um you know there's nothing i don't think there's anything where i was expecting something was going to leap out as this massive issue and then it wasn't or vice versa um partly because because it's such a big phenomenon because it's such a complex picture you know it may be that certain factors are slightly more or less significant than others um but you know they're all in the mix somewhere i think maybe the big thing and and this didn't strike me as sort of some radical revelation but having seen how the book's been received by americans um at least some have found it surprising um and something they'd not thought about before is the role of the cold war in some of this um in kind of keeping down 
dampening down the sort of the possibility of thinking oneself as having no religion, um, you know, throughout the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, you know, to me, it's obvious that kind of Cold War rhetoric around godless communism versus Christian America, you know, would tend to, you know, make people who don't practice or don't believe all other things being equal still want to see themselves as being some kind of, you know, good American and therefore some kind of respectable Christian. Um and therefore, when the Cold War ends and you get a generation coming of age who've largely been raised after the Cold War, um, which is what the millennials are, um, and also for whom the new kind of big US enemy number one isn't people with uh, too little religion, it's people with too much religion in Islamic fundamentalists, um, you know, I've, I've always assumed that that must be part of the picture as to why it would be the millennials as the vanguard of this rise of the nons and the timing of it when it happens and why it hadn't happened before. Um, you know, it didn't surprise me um, that, you know, that became, you know, a, a theme in the book. Um, but equally, it's not something that, that I think has been really talked about or kind of hypothesized much in, in previous research. So maybe that's kind of one of the... You know the real, um, I don't know, the the either insightfully original or wildly idiosyncratic, um, you know, contributions that the book makes to the field. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, well, Stephen, I've taken up a lot of your time, but in the last few minutes that we have left, uh, can you tell us what you're currently working on? Oh, I'm working on all sorts of stuff. I'm just you know trying to <laughs> keep on top of four young kids and you know teaching and that kind of stuff um there's a there's a, there's a new book not this new book there's a, a newer book out um and, and that, that's partly just because the pandemic kind of we're not talking about the pandemic actually we could talk about the pandemic don't have time um the you know various book projects got kind of you know bunched up um so several have come out at the same time but the vatican to a very short introduction um with oxford university press is literally just about to be published um and i'm working on various projects at the minute um something on religion and aliens actually that we, we might talk about in a different a different podcast um, but yeah oh my yeah please do come back <laughs> i'd be delighted to <laughs> talk <laughs> about what i said before about how you know i get to watch american pop culture and call it research i mean ancient aliens is a is a fascinating uh, uh documentary series for all sorts of reasons um but not least, I think, as a kind of a, a carrier of some of these kind of atheistic ideas in a in a very different way than, you know, we think of like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris. You know, there's a kind of there's a whole other kind of American atheism and non-religiosity, I think, that we often don't notice because it doesn't look like the kind of the stereotype of, you know, secularism, whatever. Anyway, that's a whole other. That's a whole yeah, other that sounds to me like a kind of I've heard the term re-enchantment, like this. Yeah, this... Well, this kind of like spooky. You know, like people who you know, the fact you don't believe in God doesn't mean you don't believe in all sorts of exactly. Know, like people stuff, want to right? replace the magic of religion with a different kind of magic, and so they they get into a variety. And America yeah. is, is a yeah, hotbed yeah, yeah. for these kinds of Big things. Foot, oh, yeah, you know, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Ah, oh, sounds really good. Well, uh, yeah, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, your your book brought a really different way of looking at the rise of the nuns, which is a phenomenon I'd heard about. So I was really happy to be able to read into more detail about it. I encourage listeners to check out the book. It's a very engaging, uh, easy to read, but full of a lot of really in interesting academic ideas. Good, so that was, uh, that was what I was aiming for. So I'm delighted excellent. to write it like that. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for being able to chat with me about it today in person here. So pleasure. I want to thank you for listening to new books and secularism, a podcast channel on the new books network. Once again, I'm Carrie Lynn Evans, and I've been speaking with professor Stephen Bullivant about his new book, Nonverts, the making of ex Christian America published by Oxford university press. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write us a positive review in your podcast player post about us on social media, or tell a friend. I'm also interested in hearing from you about your thoughts on this podcast and the material we cover. 
tell me about it. You can find me on Twitter at Carrie Lynnland. That's at C-A-R-R-I-E-L-Y-N-N-L-A-N-D. As it happens, you can also find Stephen on Twitter at S.S. Bullivant. Do you have a book you'd like covered on one of our shows? Contact us through our website, newbooksnetwork.com. Also, be sure to like the New Books Network page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, where you'll see every time we post a new interview. In the meantime, I'll wish you an à la prochaine from Quebec until my next conversation about new books. 